If you haven't seen episode 42 of Crepuscular Bronies Discuss, go watch it now. A certain special someone made a cameo. I finally get to talk about Gravity Falls. Again. I recently talked about this in my Q&A video. I said that its closest peers Friendship is Magic, and they are of roughly the same quality. Generally, if you like one, it's pretty safe to say that you'll like the other. Gravity Falls is of more consistent quality. It doesn't hit the highs of Friendship's Hurricane Fluttershy or the lows of its Ghostbusters. And you could draw the line between many episodes because they tend to do the same plots. Uh, they tend to do the same stories. But sometimes they take a concept, say a Halloween episode, and take them in different directions. This is one of the more known episodes, and it's definitely one of the more popular. So, let's take a look at what makes it so great. It starts with the Pines family going to the Summerween Superstore. Apparently, the people of Gravity Falls love Halloween so much that they celebrate it twice a year. I wish I could celebrate holidays twice a year. Dipper and Mabel run to go find costumes, while Seuss plays with some plastic skulls. And Stan goes to find some props to scare people. Their shenanigans get them kicked out of the store. Not today! My eyes! Okay, then. Mabel and Dipper are talking about their past experiences of trick-or-treating, when Seuss tells them to beware of the Summerine trickster. The trickster goes door to door, so the legend goes, eating children who lack the summerweed spirit. The story is interrupted by Dipper choking on some loser candy. He throws it out, and we hear some breathing. Someone rings at the doorbell. It's Wendy and her boyfriend. Yeah, Dipper has a crush on her. They're a lot closer in age than they look. As in, Dipper is 12 and Wendy is 15. In any case, it's not as, uh, unnatural as the last thing I reviewed. And we are not going to mention that again. Robbie asks if Dipper is going trick-or-treating, and to stave off embarrassment, he says that trick-or-treating is for babies. Wendy tells Dipper to come to a party with them at 9 that night, and so he decides to go. What am I gonna tell Mabel? Hey, subtlety. That's a lot about what makes this show so great. They don't bludgeon you with the point. Mabel introduces her friends to Stan, Candy and Grenda. You know what? You figure out who is who. Oh, and Mabel's pet pig, yes, she has a pet pig, just roll with it, is wearing a suit costume. Dipper, however, comes down the stairs not wearing any costume at all. He plays sick and blames it on the bad candy. Then this thing comes trick-or-treating at the Pines house. Dipper says that he's too old and shuts the door on him. They have a little back and forth like that, until Mabel finally opens the door. You have insulted me, and for this you must pay with your lives. Well, that escalated quickly. To prove that he means it, he eats a kid who introduces himself as Gorney. No! Not Gorney! No, he doesn't appear in any other episodes that I know of. In order to avoid being eaten, they have to bring this guy, the Summerween Trickster, 500 pieces of candy by the time the last Jack-O-Melon goes out. The choice is yours, children. You must trick or treat. Or die. That sounds... reasonable. Dipper is panicked, but Mabel is happy that Dipper has to come trick or treating. Yeah, she's pretty crazy like that. Seuss comes outside and identifies the monster as the Summerween Trickster. Listen up, people! Now some might say that being cursed by a bloodthirsty holiday monster is a bad thing. Mabel is not one of those people. She rallies up the group to go trick-or-treating, and they all force Dipper to come along. Meanwhile, Stan is on a quest to scare some kids. He uses a melting face trick that scares off some of the jumpy ones, but a duo isn't scared. His other tricks don't seem to be too effective either. They have apparently been watching horror movies since they were two years old. It's pretty sad that they had to make that number that low to make that an exaggeration. This subplot has a lot of good humor, but I won't bring it up again for the most part, since it'll probably break the momentum of my review. It's still good, it's just not too important to the rest of the story. Back to trick-or-treating. Because Dipper isn't wearing a costume, they aren't getting much candy. Dipper still doesn't want to put on his costume, but the trickster comes back. He pretty much intimidates them, taking one piece of candy and blowing out a jack-o'-melon. That's enough to get Dipper into his costume. It's 7 p.m. now, but their new costumes really help them with trick-or-treating. They get loads of candy from pretty much every single house, but the jack-o'-melons are going out. They made it to the last house, Zeus goes to get his truck, and Wendy and her boyfriend are coming by. Dipper takes off his costume and hides the wheelbarrow of candy in the bushes. They have a little chat that Mabel overhears. She's pretty angry at him, not for lying, but planning to ditch her. Before they could continue that argument, they find out that the candy fell off of a cliff and into a river, and all of the jack-o'-melons are out, except for one. They take it from that crazy old guy, but it ends up going out anyway. Then the Summerween trickster arrives in an actually creepy scene. He wants his candy, and it's too late for them to get any more. Dipper throws a candy bar at him, and he absorbs it. The trickster grabs all four of the kids, but Seuss runs them over with a truck. That wasn't like a regular pedestrian, was it? And that's how you make a dark joke funny, unlike our last experience. Even though the monster is dead, Mabel is still angry. Angry at Dipper specifically. She had hurt herself during their getaway, but doesn't want to listen to anything Dipper has to say about it. And then we learn that they aren't done with their monster problem yet. It turns into the monstrous no-face from Spirited Away and starts attacking the truck. It gets flung off, but causes the truck to crash into the Summerween Superstore. And we have a full scene of suspense. Sort of. Now you're 
worried about the monster. I thought all you cared about was Wendy. Yeah, this is probably not the best time to sort out their issues. Or get the moral of the episode. This is the episode's only real flaw. Mabel was so insistent on getting Dipper to go trick-or-treating because they wouldn't have many more opportunities to do so in the future. The group is about to leave, but Seuss wants to play with those skeleton heads again. Luckily, the batteries are dead, so Seuss puts some batteries in them. And so, the monster eats him. Yes, that's how you do character stupidity correctly. Have the stupidity affect them, and only them. Then everyone else attacks the monster with medieval weapons. Sure, why not? In the process, they learn that the monster tastes like salt water taffy. The monster is made of loser candy. He takes revenge on picky children who cast him aside. No one would eat him, so he's going to eat them. Or he would if Seuss didn't pop out of him, chewing the whole way. The monster starts coughing up jelly beans. You know, this would be really graphic if he wasn't made out of candy. I mean, that thing that Seuss is holding is his heart. No, really, it looks like his heart. The monster is happy that someone thinks he tastes good. That was all he ever wanted. And so Seuss eats the heart. Oh yeah, and Gorney is okay. I've been traumatized. Awesome! Meanwhile, the kids wanting their candy try to find Stan, and when they find him, he's naked in the bathroom, causing them to run away screaming. When Mabel and Dipper get back, they find that Wendy has returned. She said that the party sucked, and that Robbie got sick. Mabel's disappointed that they didn't get any candy. Luckily, Stan has the candy that the terrified kids dropped. Then they all enjoy their night with one of the lost Ed Wood films. I ate a man alive tonight.